So today, this morning, we have the, the pleasure to uh, listen to De Jason Link. For those who still don't know Jason, I will introduce him shortly. Dr. Link is a senior scientist for ecosystem for, he's a senior scientist for ecosystems at NOAA Fisheries. He's one of the few scientists, advisors for all NOAA Fisheries. He is a marine ecologist working on trophic dynamics, ecosystem modeling, socio-ecological indicators. He assembles large synthesis on ecosystems. A good example is his recently published book, which I recommend personally. His work paves the way to implement ecosystem-based fisheries management. Today, he will talk to us about systems thinking, that is making his title short, and its importance for managing fisheries. So, welcome, Jason. La parole est à toi. The floor is yours. First thing I need to do is thank you all for coming. I was talking to the General Secretary of ICES. I haven't even gotten to the funny part yet. So, um, okay. And uh, anyways, he said, for those of you who showed up, braved the rain, stayed up last night, there's free beer all day today. I ICES is paying for it. So. Okay, that wasn't as funny, sorry. Um, Thank you for the kind words, uh, Pierre. Um, thank you all for the honor of inviting me to be a keynote speaker at this prestigious, prominent, and post-COVID ICES annual science conference. I recall my first science conference. I remember sitting in the audience listening to the keynote speaker, and I vividly remember thinking, what is that old guy talking about? And how does it relate to my work? And I wish he wasn't so boring. So first of all, I'm not going to tell you what year that was or who the speaker was. Um, next of all, I'm going to try to be engaging if you'll allow that. And finally, thank you very much. You've confirmed that I'm now one of the older guys. So um, seriously, thank you. ICES has been a great community to work with and partner with over the years. It's been wonderful to be involved with you. So I need your involvement, if, if you can agree with that, somebody nod or whatever, but um, thank you. Appreciate that, one of you did. Um, trying to get the next slide, if I could have. No, the next slide. There it is. I need you to keep your eye on the ball. Uh, what I'm going to do today, here's my job. I'm going to try to be constructively disruptive. Not disruptive for the sake of being disruptive, but disruptive perhaps to challenge dogma and perhaps to force us to pause and think. Uh, I think we really also need to more closely examine some of our working assumptions. And really, at the end of the day, I want to further explore some of the paradigms in how we conduct our marine science. So help me do my job today by keeping your eye on the ball. You got that. All right. So like me, some of you uh, may still be fighting a bit of jet lag. Uh, some of you may be a bit hungover because it was a good banquet from what I heard last night. Um, whatever the situation, let me ask those of you who are in those situations to wake up and pay attention right now. These are the takeaways I want you to leave with from the talk. Again, you all read them and ignored me as I was speaking. So I, I basically, the paradigms for marine science, I think, need updating. I think we can only go so far with reductionism. We desperately need to change the dimensions and scales at which we focus. And I want to energize you and mobilize you and mobilize us as a marine science community to overcome inertia. So if you're fighting jet lag or you're hungover, you're more than welcome to go back to sleep. Okay, thank you for the polite laugh. Um, in what follows, I'm going to unpack each thread a little further. Uh, this is going to be a little atypical talk. You probably, some of you might have expected that, but uh, I'm going to give three or four stories 
I'm going to give certainly a few graphs, a little science, but I want to maybe focus on a few different things. So let me start with this. Uh, I remember once, and I was reflecting on a lot of things as I was putting this talk together. I was sitting in a forge fish stock assessment meeting. And there was all this arguing. You can see that arguing in that cartoon. And everybody was contentious and it was boisterous. And everybody was upset over this. And it got into this argument over fourth decimal point precision about B or F or something or other. And there was this parameter and I think it was like herring. And you can see like there was this red bar there, 0.0004 or whatever it was. And I was thinking, what about M? And then we had the, the famous solution that you see there. So the next meeting we came back and I estimated some consumptive removals and I presented them. And they were big and it kind of took over a lot of our estimates and they were really shocking to a lot of people and that bar for consumption was this large monolith it was huge um, so anyways uh that's sean lucy and a goosefish i can never remember which one is which but they <laughs> they both eat a lot right and sorry he's not here so i'm safe but um so anyways you compare the little red bar we're arguing over four significant decimal points and you got this big huge estimate of consumption and i'm like this is five to ten times greater than the landings what, what are we doing here and it it struck me we got to think about this. So I, I basically spent, you know, about the next 10 years trying to get better estimates of predation mortality, M2, and to get this into stock assessments. And there was all this evidence. You can see um, the Hake example on the upper left, uh, how much consumption relative to the catch. At some points, it was 20 times more than what we were catching. Uh, you can see the example. Does this make a difference with uh, M2 or mortality and all of these different things relative to the reference points BM, B over BMSY. If you ignore predation, the stock's fine. But if you start considering predation, that red line, oh my, we're not as good as we thought. So we did all this, we synthesized it in consumption to catch ratios or consumption to landings. When they're about one, you got to pay attention. That's kind of the threshold. We got to pay attention. When total mortality Z where it was split between F and M, you got to pay attention to natural mortality. Uh, that was a rule of thumb. But what we saw, particularly for these four stocks, is that ratio is like three to five times. And then the M2 for these stocks was like two to four times. So there was all of this evidence that we were wrestling with. And despite all this overwhelming evidence, I kept running into significant resistance. And then I wasn't sure that I wanted to spend the rest of my life chasing this level of fourth significant decimal point figures. And it struck me that we had different paradigms approaching this. So I want to talk about scientific paradigms for a moment. That's a pair of dimes. All right, I'll stop. But a paradigm is how we view the world. It's a worldview. It's a way of approaching a challenge. And what, what is striking to me in this is that we have a lot of different underpinnings of our marine science and our paradigms. So what I'm about to show you is a major scientific breakthrough never been shown before. So get ready. We have an embargo. We've, we've asked people to turn off their phones. I've got a major breakthrough I want to show you. Are you ready? Those two ecosystems are different. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, first of all, the, the ocean has very different properties than this other ecosystem on land, right? The field is, is different. And these distinctions, okay, I'm joking, we knew that. But the, the distinctions have been documented before. They're obvious, they're intuitive. I'm not gonna repeat them here. Um, the one thing I would say is that most of us are land-based organisms. Um, most of us are mammals. Uh, uh, never mind. Um, but 
most of us are land-based mammals, and we experience a very different set of environmental conditions than what organisms in the ocean experience. And I think sometimes, as much as we try to remember that, we forget that. And really, that has implications because the second thing to note about these scientific paradigms is that what we consider and operate in has changed. A lot of the science paradigms that were developed came about in the broader context of a worldview that was very different than the worldview and the context that we live in now. And in many cases, I think what we're saying is that a lot of the scientific thinking, the statistics, our experimental designs, even our management of natural resources developed in the context of this agrarian land-based situation. So. I understand that, I think you understand that, but I question if that's appropriate, even the closely related rocky intertidal zones that have shaped so much of marine ecology, I'm not sure that's as appropriate for us now and for a lot of the situations that we're facing. So let me think about this and let me give you an example. The third thing to note about scientific paradigms is that the conditions when science started or developed are very different. So let's compare some of those. It's really an era of very different data, computing power, analytical options, and so forth. And we'll talk about that. But let me contrast a few things and statistics from the past 100 years of how everyday life has changed. You can see on the, the top uh, row is the different decades, and the operational paradigm is farming or machinery or analog, digital, whatever. But the mode of understanding was deterministic uh, and then stochastic and maybe even chaotic now. And the understanding paradigm was really reductionist, mechanistic, and we still have that and you still hear calls for that to this day. But I think we're really shifting a lot of other scientific disciplines towards an integrative or more holistic look. Um, the complexity, the scale of emphasis, you know, you can see those basically increase over time. The connectivity, we had very low regional, local connections, and now we're, we're basically hyper-connected. Um, you all could be ignoring me and looking at your phone and checking all this right now. That's how connected we are. Please don't, by the way. Um, the, the communication, you know, was with letters. Um, now, again, we have text and messaging and the speed in the U.S. of our national highway system, the speed limit in miles per hour has gone from 45 miles per hour to um, 80 miles per hour. So there's an increase in speed. Um, the size of the computer used to take up entire rooms and now they fit on not your pocket anymore, they fit in your watch if you think about that. Uh, the percent of the population, again, this is a U.S. example from uh, the census survey or census organization, not quite a half of the population was rural. And you go through time and now less than one fifth of the population is rural. And then you can see the size of the population. So overall, our everyday life has gotten faster, more data intensive, more interconnected, more crowded and less mechanical. And let me just reiterate that with this next slide. These conditions have changed. Summing up another way, the science that was developed 100 years ago is was developed in conditions that are very different than the conditions we have today. Hopefully, I've briefly demonstrated that to you. You can read the, the contrast there. Uh, that really gives an implication, I think, of what is underpinning the science that was developed 100 years ago or 50 years ago or 70 years ago and are we adapting to these changing cultural conditions so to get back to my conundrum of considering mortality for forage as being driven by different paradigms what struck me was this focus on reductionism and it was really ultimately to come up with this or elucidate the mechanism, the process that others were omitting because they were simplifying complex situations. So that to me led to a scientific paradox. And I'll pause. 
I'm going to just stop. People are groaning. But the, the, the paradox was, was this, that as science sought to test hypotheses, expand knowledge, better understanding, increasing complexity, it needed to constrain information and experiments to what was feasible and contextual. It's a weird paradox. We want to understand more complexity, but to do that, we have to simplify the complexity. And by so doing, I think it limited the hypotheses, maybe still does, just saying, it limited the hypotheses we could test and perhaps the information it could generate. So that's kind of a, a smack in the face. That's pretty early to do before 10 o'clock in the morning. So I apologize for that. Actually, I don't. I think it's fun. But the, the, the point is that these simplifying assumptions to help deal with this really were to get us to this reduction-based science. And the science needed to adopt or adapt these simplifying assumptions. And you see the simplifying assumptions here that were occurring in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Stationarity, isolated factors, univariate responses, minimal cross-interactions, non-manageable levers, things we could not control were trivial. Uh, or that was the assumption, the statistical relationships erode over time. There was one mechanism. If we could just find the one mechanism, we'd nail things. And I'm not sure those are still appropriate. I want you to think about that. Is it inaccurate? Is it unnecessary to do that given the computing power that we have, given the statistical tools that we now have? That's multivariate, not Martha's Vineyard. Never mind, that's a joke if you're in the U.S. right now. But uh, um, the long time series of data we have, all the network methods and the systems theory and emergent properties and complex system dynamics, chaos dynamics, even fractal dynamics, all, all this stuff that's out there. Why are we still using some of the same assumptions? So let me show you an example of how reductionist thinking can lead to a focus on solely one mechanism that focuses on a univariate problem for a taxa that doesn't consider interdisciplinary input and often results in unintended and perhaps decidedly not preferred outcomes. Could I get some help getting this video going, please? I'm gonna just sit back, take a risk and be quiet for three minutes. Please play it. I'm going to watch you. It had to be said, the Oregon State Highway Division not only had a whale of a problem on its hands, it had a stinking whale of a problem. What to do with one 45-foot, 8-ton whale dead on arrival on the beach near Florence? It had been so long since a whale had washed up in Lane County, nobody could remember how to get rid of one. In selecting its battle plan, the Highway Division decided the carcass couldn't be buried because it might soon be uncovered. It couldn't be cut up and then buried because nobody wanted to cut it up, and it couldn't be burned. So dynamite it was, some 20 cases or a half ton of it. The hope was that the long dead Pacific gray whale would be almost disintegrated by the blast, it's and that dynamite. any small pieces still around after the explosion would be taken care of by seagulls and other scavengers. Indeed, the seagulls had been standing nearby all day. As everything was being made ready, we asked George Thornton, the highway engineer in charge of the project, for his final observation. Well, I'm confident that it'll work. The only thing is we're not sure just exactly how much uh, explosives it'll take to disintegrate this thing so the scavengers, seagulls and crabs and whatnot can clean it up. Is there any chance it might be more than a one-day job? Uh, if there's any large chunks left and uh, we may have to do some other cleanup, possibly set another charge. The dynamite was buried primarily on the leeward side of the big mammal, so as most of the remains would be blown toward the sea. About 75 bystanders, most of them residents who had first found the whale to be an object of curiosity before they tired of its smell, were moved back a quarter of a mile away. The sand dunes there were covered with spectators and land lubber newsmen, shortly to become land blubber newsmen, with the blast blasted blubber beyond all believable bounds. Our 
Our cameras stopped rolling immediately after the blast. The humor of the entire situation suddenly gave way to a run for survival as huge chunks of whale blubber fell everywhere. Pieces of meat passed high over our heads while others were falling at our feet. The dunes were rapidly evacuated as spectators escaped both the falling debris and the overwhelming smell. A parked car over a quarter of a mile from the blast site was the target of one large chunk. The passenger compartment literally smashed. Fortunately, no human was hit as badly as the car. However, everyone on the scene was covered with small particles of dead whale. As for the success of the effort, well, the seagulls who were supposed to clean things up were nowhere in sight, either scared away by the explosion or kept away by the smell. That didn't really matter. The remaining chunks were of such a size that no respectable seagull would attempt to tackle anyway. As darkness began to set in, the highway crews were back on the beach burying the remains, including a large piece of the carcass which never left the blast site. It might be concluded that should a whale ever wash ashore in Lane County again, those in charge will not only remember what to do, they'll certainly remember what not to do. Thank you. Um, so, as disturbing Remember, or funny as that may have been, I think it proves a point, probably many points. Um, my point that I wanted you to take away with that is that reductionist, single discipline, myopic, univariate solution are not always the best solutions. Um, hopefully I've convinced you in this context that how we do science has changed and I think the approaches of how we do science and perspectives developed from those older contexts should probably change too. The question becomes how do we do that? So this uh, is an excellent rendition of the North Sea from our colleagues at IMR in Norway. I use this all the time. Uh, what I would tell you is that life is multivariate. There's there's the money quote. Life is multivariate. You can somebody can tweet that or whatever you call it. But life is multivariate. Look at this, and your eyes are naturally drawn to the typical state variables, things like cod or flounder or birds or even the plankton are in here, even pot potentially uh, physical phenomena like waves. And you might also see, if you look closely, some ocean use sectors like fishing or oil and gas or implied maybe conservation or even tourism. But what about all the invisible parts of this ecosystem? The invisible is important too. Things like the air-water interface dynamics or the thermocline or internal waves or carbon sequestration or nitration fixation let alone any of the vital biological rates like metabolism or primary production or even implied predation. Or even, I would say, implied governance structure, both in the image here and in the room. So the point being is that marine ecosystems are complex and trying to reduce them down to simple component parts is bound to miss some key considerations. Again, staring at this image and recalling your own experiences and observations while you've perhaps been at sea, you don't need me to tell you that marine ecosystems are complex. You don't need me to tell you that marine ecosystems are multivariate. And you don't need me to tell you that marine ecosystems have multiple uses. Marine ecosystems also have multiple objectives placed on them. So to address all of this, I would argue we need a multidisciplinary approach and we need multiple dimensions that will give us the relativity of these different processes. So let's look at some of these dimensions. So by dimensions, I don't mean in the comic book sense of multiple universes, the latest Spider-Man movie or whatever, but um, what I'm saying is we typically look at uh, the four dimensions, time, and the three of space, X, Y, and Z, or depth. And really, the different views on those, the different ways we emphasize that, I think leads to different views on the relativity of different processes. And I think it has multiple potential solutions for a problem. And typically, we have done this. We focused on DN and we reduce these multi-dimensional problems into one dimension. And I think that's understandable. Don't get me wrong, I get it. Uh, the classical response to changing dynamics and conditions has focused primarily on time. And we understand that. And it's understandable. But 
all of this has been done in a management context. And I would say, what about multiple dimensions when considering a problem beyond just time? So the reductionist worldview always reduces these multidimensional problems into one dimension. And again, there's nothing wrong with that, but we miss the relativity of processes. We miss perhaps, I would argue, other potential solutions. And what information are we losing by focusing solely on integrating across DT? So one can say, well, what about space, right? What about DX or DY or DZ or over depth? What if instead we integrated over space? I get that there are challenges with spatial considerations. Um, many, many contexts, it can be very important in particularly in marine systems. And given how our science arose, which was mainly, again, land-based, we tend to think of spatial factors as fixed which they most definitely are not in the ocean. Can examining the spatial dimension help address some of the changes we see? I pose that question to you. And what about DN over DT? Emphasizing the N. I'm not sure we've really explored the taxonomic dimension in an applied context that much. And really, there's a lot less challenges, I think, of dealing with the taxonomic dimension and a fair bit of benefits. That builds on hierarchy theory, and we'll get to that in a moment. Uh, the other thing I want to flag is what about other dimensions beyond what we typically include in our main equations? And this is for all the social scientists and economists in the room and SIHD. What about the human dimension dimension? What about that? How, are, are we modeling that just as much as we are DN or DT? And are we integrating over those things? There might even be other dimensions we're not looking at and so on. You get the point. So I would return to the fact that life is multivariate, that marine ecosystems are multivariate. And let me show you this example by omitting different dimensions and especially by omitting different disciplines and variables to try to get out of this multivariate complexity, we lose the ability to ascertain the relativity of processes. So some earlier work we had done in the late 1990s, early 2000s, which is now widely repeated, used this really impressive method. You ready? Wait for it. It's called multivariate statistics. No one's laughing. <laughs> All right. And those multivariate statistics elucidated the relative importance of various processes, and we could get the, the time trajectory you see on the right picture with basically principal components, which has very robust and widely ignored assumptions. So the point is that you can use more savvy multivariate statistics and begin to understand the relativity of, is it an environmental factor? Is it fishing? Is it whatever? And we're, we're doing that a lot more. And the, what this work highlighted was that beyond the historical fishing versus the environment debate that we won't repeat here, we often focus on processes, protocols, variables, whatever, that have had historical disciplinary prominence from there, a time when there was less information and computing power, but I think it makes less sense to do so now. There's a little challenge to us as a discipline. Another example, which has also been widely validated and replicated, and I promise you, Scouts Honor, I did not consult with Tuesday morning's keynote speaker, is the prominence of jellyfish. And we found that the largest source of energy flux in a temperate continental shelf food web model with an energy budget was largely tied up in jellyfish. And you can see that this Emax exercise, the yellow on the left showed the uh, several of the, the processes, the input, the biomass, what we came up with in a, in a balancing exercise. And then we did a, a keystone this index, uh, Simone Liberalto's work. And you always saw jellyfish at the top on that right, uh, yeah, right panel. Anyways, the, the one at the top of the apex of the curve there was always jellyfish. It was one of the more keystone dominant species in the system. And that is a tax, as we heard Tuesday morning, is rarely routinely and synoptically surveyed anywhere in the world. And yet it can drive energy flows up to 40% of an entire ecosystem. 
and we ignore that. And that's why I'm getting at partly with the, the taxonomic dimension. Maybe we need to expand that. Many studies have demonstrated the impacts that jellyfish have had, but it remains one of the least monitored management taxa or tax in our management protocol. I think the whole point of all this is that what and how we choose to look at is important. Okay. You all are very serious. I need to get another story in here. All right. I have a confession to make. Um, I'm often the guy in a room as Noah's ecosystem guy. I'm often the guy in a room representing the perspectives of those not in the room to those who are in the room who don't really get the perspective of those who are not in the room. Did you follow all that? And I'm always like in the middle. So I routinely have to represent these upper perspectives, these different approaches, and even advocate for them. And they tend to be overlooked by various disciplines. So here's how it works. I'll be in a room full of oceanographers and they'll be talking about flow fields and NPZ models and they'll relegate an entire discipline to quadratic mortality, one parameter. And think nothing of it, never revisit it, and then marvel why the results don't always make sense. So all of you who are not oceanographers can laugh now because your turn's next. Um, the next week I'll be in a room of stock assessors or population biologists who will be discussing all kinds of parameters and say a stock recruit model or a pop die model. And then they will relegate an entire discipline of models or information into one parameter, such as R or M or whatever. And then they too will think nothing of it, never revisit it, and then marvel why their results don't make sense. So I understand that both groups have to have their focus and they have to limit what they do, but I can't help but wonder what each group might be missing by not exploring those parameters more fully. I think it's gotten better, and I would give ICES a lot of credit, but the siloing of discipline still remains. And I often wonder what would happen if these groups just got together, did the hard work of jargon translating, and informed one another. I often feel like I'm stuck in the middle trying to bridge these communities. Again, it, it's, it's um, psychologically draining. I'm emotionally drained. Thank you for saying that. I can't believe I just said that in public. Um, anyways, you add on to that, we've got social scientists who also want to be in there. And I'm there in the middle going, what is going on? It seems like all I do is run a dating site, uh, like force matchmaking for science geeks. Can you go talk to them, please? You know, so anyways. So I'm asking you, solely for my benefit and to help me feel better being selfish here. I don't care if we improve our science or do better management. I don't care about that. I just want to feel better. Please go talk to somebody, maybe with another discipline than who you're working with right now and just simplifying their work into a simplifying parameter. I'm begging you, please go talk to them. Okay. So it's admittedly not all that bad. I do have group therapy sessions with other ecosystem modelers and we um, just join all the disciplines and expand the heck out of all the parameters and just don't tell anybody. But uh, my friend Howard Townsend is great for group therapy. He was giving out business cards. He does have license uh, to deal with counseling. So that wasn't that funny. All right, I digress. Another thing to consider is that scale matters. The scale at which we operate on a problem is important. We've talked about different domains and dimensions, but we also need to talk about the resolution. And typically we do so for time or space, but it's wise to explore these in the taxonomic dimension. R recall the Reynolds number, right? It results in either laminar or turbulent flows with all these bioenergetic consequences. You all remember smaller Reynolds numbers are more viscous and they're impacted by body size and whatnot. In this context, the key observation is this. You can have two organisms, and you see the list there in that table, say a whale and a copepod. You can have two organisms in the same body of water, and they can experience incredibly different conditions based on their speed, their size, water density, perceived viscosity, et cetera. That leads into their effective Reynolds numbers. And I think that has parallel application. So, again, 
you all are looking very serious. Let me tell you another story uh, about a cage match, really, that will return to this scale issue. In one corner, weighing in at a little over one kilogram is the Atlantic cod, Gaddis morhua, a demersal mud-sucking omnivore that has formed the basis of entire cultures from Portugal to Greenland, from Canada to Norway, and it is the staple of fish and chips among many other tasty dishes. <laughs> is anybody here from the seafood industry? That was pretty good. Yeah, all right. Okay. In the other corner is the spiny dogfish. That's the villain of this match. Squalus acanthias. This beady-eyed little shark, this jellyfish and hairy-eating elasmobranchs that runs in large gangs, sorry, large schools that can swamp bottom trawls and then also make up belly flaps for fish and chips because most British pe people I know really don't care. <laughs> I presume being here in Ireland, it's okay to pick on the English. Is, it, it says that, all right, I'm sorry. <laughs> I need to apologize to our Brit friends for that joke, except for Mark Dickey Collis. I'm only giving him a half a apology because he reminds us he's half Dutch. So, uh, anyways, what was I saying? But a long time ago, there was this cage match about spiny dogfish eating all the cod on George's bank. So the situation was quite contentious. And at this point, all I have to say is that I have lived an interesting life. So, it's okay, you can have to. Um, when I was going to a fisheries management meeting to address this cod dogfish issue, I was armed solely with data and overhead transparencies. For those of you younger in the crowd, we'll explain what overhead transparencies mean later. When I was going into the room, I was stopped and denied entry into the room. They said to me, sir, you must stop, you cannot go in. I said, why? I said, we do not allow bodyguards in the meeting room. <laughs> they thought I was part of the posse to protect Fred Surchuk or Mike Sisson. I'm serious. This, this, yeah, just the way those in the IC secretary are part of the posse protecting your new general secretary here. So, um, anyway, hilarious. Hi, Alan. Um, after exclaiming that I was a bona fide scientist, I was a trophic ecologist, which kind of helps because that's pretty arcane and no one knows what it means. Um, and I got help from Fred and Mike. Uh, they let me into the room. And uh, the, the part of the story that was intriguing, I was called upon to present information to point out, you can see it out there on the right, nine out of 60,000 dogfish stomachs had caught in them. And that, that's a small number. And we modeled that all kinds of ways, but it was a small number. And it continued to go on, some of which for other reasons. But what struck me was how this perception changed over scale. If you look on the left, you can see as the denominator increased, it went from one out of 10 to one out of 100 to one out of 10,000, you know, et cetera. And yeah, we picked up another one here, there, maybe two, but um, it, the spatial extent of this occurrence of cod and dogfish stomachs was was actually really driving the story. It was, it was the resolution that we were looking at, and that, that's where there was all this contention. And then we looked at it over time, and you can see it's been you know pretty low percentage over time, and Brian Smith gave me this data, but it really drove home to me the point that our partners, our stakeholders, the scale at which we look at a problem can really influence our perceptions. And we'll return to that thread again, particularly in the taxonomic dimension, but I wanna to return to this idea of reductionism first, because that's really what is driving a lot of this. So uh, let me give you a quote. I started out studying sociology, that was really psychology, so I started to study psychology, but that was really biology. So I started to study biology, but that was really chemistry, so I started to study chemistry, but that was really physics. So I started to study physics, but that was really math, so then I became an English major. And that's a paraphrase of a famous columnist, and you can see the, the cartoon there shows that. And, and I would argue that sometimes we reduce things too much. That's another good quote if somebody wants to, to quote that.
or not, fine. Um, hey, there are pros and cons to reductionism. I get it. There, doing that makes things more manageable. It reduces complexity. It leads to mechanistic insight. I get it. Uh, it isolates an issue from broader context and all these conflating variables. It embraces the maxim that a thing is nothing but the sum of its parts. Uh, on the opposite side, reducing things to their components parts doesn't always work, and it assumes that everything can be considered via constituent parts. And I think that's false because it misses emergent properties here. And it also misses some other forms of information, and it neglects the idea that the whole is more than the sum of the parts. We could easily explore and expand on any of these. Uh, it can become quite philosophical, uh, but for today, I just want to revisit reductionism in the sense that I think it has limited our thinking, maybe even our science, the information available to us, and ultimately how it can manage marine resources. I really do think it has limited us. Uh, so let me highlight one or two major concerns res with respect to reductionism. And, and the biggest one is that I think reductionism leads to precision traps. By the way, that picture on the left you can get from the website youthinkyourjobsucks.com. Um, uh, you can see precision is very tight, but accuracy is on the bullseye, and you can have one or the other. And I think my concern that I've seen over the years, and, and I would give you as much seriousness as I can showing a picture like this, um, the concern is we've missed information. I think we've missed accuracy, and I think we've lost information because we reject observations and inputs that are just not as precise as what we might have grown to become accustomed to based on our assumptions coming from science that was developed land-based in, in, in the agrarian context. Uh, I think there's a widespread prevailing assumption which would posit for us to know anything with certainty we have to break it down until we understand all the mechanisms and more so understand and be able to quantify how all the sources of uncertainty play out. And I, I want to challenge that. I think the more precisely we can measure something, the better off we are if we lose accuracy of its meaning in the original context. That, that's a challenge. In other words, we often think we can get more precise in our measurements, but we lose the context, and we might even sacrifice accuracy, as you see in the, the bottom picture on the left with the bullseye. And I mean, that's why they invented Bayesian statistics, right? So that joke didn't land. All right. Um, I fear we've fallen into this logical trap of reducto ad absurdum with this confident constant, constant emphasis on precision over accuracy, precision over meeting and over understanding that I think we've begun to contradict, as that Latin term implies, broader forms of knowledge solely because they've not been decomposed or deconstructed into the reduction of component parts sufficiently enough. So I think there's a concern here. Maybe some of you disagree. Let's have that debate. Maybe some of you agree, and let's go for beer. But uh, Fortunately, there are rigorous ways around or out of this trap. And I want to return again to how do we get out of these reduction-driven traps with this concept of the taxonomic dimension and scale. And really, there's this concept of all these other schools of thought that have emerged and arisen the past 20, 30 years, including systems thinking, complex adaptive systems, cybernetics, network dynamics, information theory, portfolio theory, this concept of emergence, et cetera. All of those basically point to hierarchy theory, and it really posits that um, properties of a system are different at different levels of observation. You can see the examples there uh, on those pictures. And there's really an ordering or a hierarchy. And again, I know those of you in the social sciences, particularly some sociology and psychology, there's a different context here. So that's not what I'm getting at. I'm just talking in natural systems, there's hierarchical ordering and complex adaptive systems. It's widely and commonly observed. And what you see is that this hierarchy is 
repeatedly observed. It's almost a central tenet of these systems. There's flexibility among the different system components. Higher system levels or levels higher up in the hierarchy exert constraints on the lower levels. The levels tend to operate at about the same rate, so things at the same level of hierarchy you know, tend to function similar, and we see that. Think of a food web and phytoplankton dynamics versus whale dynamics or whatever. Higher levels tend to operate more slowly and a lower frequency than lower levels, and they're slower in time and larger in size, and the lower levels are the opposite, and you can actually pick up changes at these higher levels because of that uh, more quickly, which seems counterintuitive, but it's been, been shown. And all of this, again, is re repeated on tons of observations. And I would say there are practical ramifications from this in exploring data that way. Uh, we'll get into that in a second. But the taxonomic dimension or the systematic dimension, all these emergent features, if we return to that, and we see that really as an example of hierarchy theory, we can probably begin to think about a suite of organisms in aggregate or a suite of organisms as a system. And again, when we've done this and we've begun to simplify the food webs into these more aggregate groupings, what we see is that we can detect major systematic changes quicker. We seem to have more stable or robust uh, dynamics at these higher levels than we do at lower levels. There's less details to track in a time of constrained resources by all of our institutes. Uh, I really think you can get some performance metrics at an ecosystem level from this. And I think in a way, this is a form of re re dimension reduction. So just the practical ramifications of that are where we focus really determines the implications for what we see, how long it takes to detect, and how much we can deal with in any given period of time. And you can see the example there. Uh, on the left, you have a bunch of parts and the guy's trying to make a watch. And then on the right, this guy has organized all the different parts into more aggregate groupings. And he's also trying to make a watch. And one of them goes out of business because they don't have enough watches to make in enough time. And the other one is much more efficient and effective. And I, I'll show you examples of this and how that plays out in two different ecosystems here in a moment. But I think this really has ramifications for how we approach our hypothesis testing and exploring data. So I could get up here and say all this, and I, I know I'm good looking and cute and all that, but thank you for laughing at that joke. But uh, um, don't take my word for it. A lot of other people smarter than me have come to the same conclusion. Uh, Ludwig von Bertolanffy, and yes, that Bert von Bert, that's the same guy came to that conclusion. The Odom brothers, Buzz Holling, Simon Levine, Steve Carpenter, Gene Likens, Bobby Lonowitz, a lot of our contemporaries, you, you know the names, you can see them here. They're coming to the same conclusion that science has long been settled, that reductionism isn't entirely sufficient, and we need to consider complex adaptive systems, cross-scale interactions, and emergent properties. So again, smart people, smarter than me, are saying that, so I'm paying attention to them. Don't just take my word for it, not only that smart people are saying this, but let's look at evidence for it. So I'm gonna give you two ecosystems here. Both of these ecosystems, I'm showing you landings and example stocks. Both of them have very dynamic stocks in New England and Alaska. Uh, the component stocks do the classical up and down, but one system, is managed as an entire complex. In Alaska, they manage for the total, there's a total ecosystem cap is how it's in place, but they manage for the system, and then they deal with individual stocks and allocations. In New England, they're aware that the total system biomass is there and actually has been fairly stable over time, but they're managing on the individual stocks and the churn over time. What are the ramifications for that? Well, one system that manages on the stock by stock basis has a lot of overfished stocks, 
I believe that's the red line, and their value is a lot lower. That's the dotted red line. And the flip side occurs in the system that is managed as a system. Uh, the value has increased and gone up, and the number of overfished stocks or the risk to the component stocks is a lot lower. So we published that, got some attention, but uh, we start looking at these types of things over and over and over, and they're quite common globally when one looks at this. And I think, frankly, these results are ignored and not taking up because our protocols and processes tend to discount these higher hierarchical levels. And because our protocols and processes are not set up to think beyond a reductionist manner. And I would argue we probably need to change that. I should probably stop soon, right? Good, because I'm on my last slide. Um, let me conclude. Let me reiterate the take home points. Our paradigms for doing marine science need updating. Reductionism can only go so far. We really need to change the dimensions and scales on which we focus. And let's mobilize as a community to overcome the inertia, because we can do this. I think we can. So I'm pretty sure I did not cover everything that I wanted to cover, or as well as I could have done, or that you had hoped for. Nor did I do so in an error-free, 100% convincing fashion. But I do trust that my best efforts here, at the very least, were thought-provoking, different than what one would normally see in a keynote talk. Hopefully they were engaging, hopefully you kept your eye on that ball, and maybe even mildly entertaining in one or two small points. I hope I did my job and challenged your thinking, and I challenged dogma, challenged our assumptions and paradigms. But more so, I hope I gave you some things to think about for further ongoing discussions in the future. So I sincerely thank you for your time and attention. Thank you again. Thank you, Jason, for this profound and entertaining talk. We have a few uh, moments for questions. Hi, Ed. Thanks for a great talk. In English, we have a saying, never let the perfect be the enemy of the good. In other words, we can never know everything, but if we're going to put every, lots of things together, how much complexity is enough? The, yeah, because we can never know everything. Yeah, and thank you for not picking on me about fish and chips, yeah. too. So, uh, <laughs> um, how much do we need to know? And probably a lot more than we do now, but probably less than we, we need to. I, I agree with you is the point is that we don't need to have perfect knowledge of everything to get moving on this. And that I think is the mentality that's hampered us. You know, we don't have the mechanistic understanding of 52 stocks and 47 plankton critters and so on. I think what we need to do is just get out there and try and start looking at these more holistic emergent things and looking at it systematically. And whenever we've done that, for example, on the food web where you and I have talked about that, the gaps will show up very quickly in what you need to know and then you can adjust and adapt and go after those. So thanks, John. Thank you, Jason. Uh, Dorothy Donko, Sintaf Ocean, and chair of the Nordic Marine Think Tank. Very, very good. Thank you so much for bringing all this up because um, there are a lot of elephants in the room, as Jonathan White also showed in Crocken's Lair. Are we ready to be wrong, though? I think is one of the implications of this. And uh, there's one thing to be a good scientist, and another thing to be the messenger and trying to communicate. For example, a stock assessment that you don't really believe in because of our institutional setup of how we do fish stocks. So what are the real implications for IC scientists to challenge these paradigms? I suspect you have an answer to your question. <laughs> I'm tempted to let you give it. <laughs> um, my sense is Yes, there are ramifications. Yes, there's 
practical limitations. Yes, there's history and structural stuff and so forth. My job today is to flag, hey, maybe we need to look at that. And maybe a bench scientist, a stock assessment scientist continues to raise that, continues to push for changes in terms of reference, continues to push for, hey, more systematic looks. But I'm also speaking to chairs of working groups and sessions and parts of the organization. Maybe we need to take a look at that ourselves, a hard look at that. Is there another way we can organize or structure our teams, et cetera, et cetera? I don't have that answer. I'm just asking the question. Maybe we ought to. Excuse me. We have a question from uh, uh, the internet. <laughs> so we, we make it a bit complex, you know, for people not in the room asking questions. Okay. In an environment of lots of competitive bidding uh, for funding, do you think that reductionism is part of a defense mechanism? Probably. <laughs> Probably. You want me to elaborate I'm, yeah, by that look? Um, I think it is, and I think it's a way to deal with things. And I'm not picking on funding organizations, but I, having said that, you know now I'm going to that. Um, you know, the projects are what, three years in duration typically, or a couple of years, they're limited in scale and scope. And and it, it's difficult if you're funding a bigger, more synthetic, holistic thing, because who gets left out? And that's a consideration, I get that. Uh, at the opposite side of that, maybe there are ways that we can begin to develop more integrated programs and having parts of the funding organizations within the organization equally be less siloed and maybe come up with joint types of RFPs or calls. So so there's there's ways around it. There's we've we've looked at that in, in other contexts. So probably it is a defense mechanism, but there are ways to get around it. And again, it speaks to the structural nature of how we do science that I'm again not expecting perhaps any individual scientist to change, but maybe to push for that change. And then as a community, if enough people are pushing, some of those structures may more for change. So is that a better answer than probably? That's okay. an answer. Yeah. All right. It's an answer. <laughs> that doesn't make me feel good, but okay. It's got a lot of sense. Thank you. Okay, Andrea Morf uh, from Norregio and, and the Swedish Institute for the Marine Environment. I really sympathize with you. I have made a trip from natural sciences converted to social scientists. Uh, now I'm exactly in the same position as you, <laughs> sitting in the chair in between everyone. So one thing there, and I would like also to respond to what uh, this person on the internet was saying about funding. This is something that I have discovered if you want to go work interdisciplinarily. The funding signals are rather for disciplinary and for competition. And in order to do the kind of analysis that you are suggesting, this is really something that needs more financial uh, incentives. But as a representative of the Swedish Institute for the Marine Environment, I would like to ask a very concrete question about how do you think about environmental monitoring? Because uh, we are, so to say, advising government and different levels of governance on how to do the environmental monitoring. And what you're suggesting here is actually putting a lot of things together that have so far not been put together on one hand. And then I'm also thinking, I mean, marine basins are connected. So we need an international marine monitoring that is overwhelmingly big, but very interesting. So what are your thoughts how this could develop further? Yeah, the, the simplest answer to your question is maybe we just keep doing our monitoring, but we look at the data we already have in different ways. And we started doing that in NOAA a, you know, a while ago, and that's where a lot of some of these emergent insights started popping out. And there are enough global databases, there are enough satellite-derived databases. There's a lot more information than we tend to realize because we want to understand the length of the seventh CTA on a copepod antenna in our particular bay. Uh, but there's probably, if we get past that level of mechanistic detail, there might be zooplankton data around a, a, an entire sea that could be integrated with some infrastructural changes or, or attention. And, and again, I don't know how global or international you're, you're getting. I'm presuming you're talking in, in these regions here. The sense is 
just pulling people together and maybe incentivizing the data sharing and the data uh, inter interoperability and those availability, to those types of things. And we see that happening in a lot of places moving towards that. So those would be some simple things I would do to start. But I, I also take your point. There are integrated monitoring surveys is probably where we need to go. But I, I'm seeing that trend in a lot of places in the world where it's not just, you know, a whale survey, there's plankton, there's CT, you know, it, it, that's pretty common in a lot of places. So. Hopefully that helps give you some sense. So, okay. Thank you. Yeah. We have one Hi. last question here. Oh, front. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Okay. It's very short but very complex. <laughs> Thanks for the talk, Jason. Sofia Kochalski, University of Santiago de Compostela. I wanted to ask: Is it now enough to put our models together? So do I start? Do I stick my governance model to a nice ecosystem model and then I have the complexity? Or do we need totally new models? And you hinted towards some disciplines like complex, uh, complexity theory and so on. But if we take the models from there, maybe we make again the mistake, which you said in the beginning, oh, we shouldn't have taken all the stuff from the terrestrial people. So do we need to make up totally new models and methods? Or is it enough to come together and put our stuff together? I would do that to start and see how you're doing. And model coupling is not easy, but it's not impossible. And then uh, similar to an answer I just gave, as you do that, maybe you realize it's inappropriate and you need to build something new. But I would try with what we have and then challenge the assumptions. And even as you just said, those interdisciplinary approaches coupled together are going to challenge one another in their assumptions. So. Hopefully that's a simple answer. So one, last one last question. Was it? Sorry. Uh, just this one should be quick at least. So that's good. <laughs> um, it begs the question that when you're combining a lot of information with a lot of existing databases and a lot of models, this requires either a large team or a very long period of time. And it's definitely not a one person job to create a study like this or even a three person job most of the time. So science tends to have this pressure that you need to publish a paper at least once a year to survive. <laughs> and a lot of times these model developments and integrations when they get to a certain complexity definitely take more than one year. Is there a way to approach this or a way you can imagine reshaping science to get rid of this publish or die mentality or to extend the duration of the studies to where we can do more meaningful, comprehensive analyses? So I hear what you're saying and I hear what you didn't say and I understand your frustration of all those pressures. I would challenge your beginning assumption though of we need to take a lot of time and have huge teams and it gets complicated. I would actually start with a small team and do something simple, take the information we have, but look at it in a more aggregated way. It it literally takes me in the SAS code. Sorry, I just dated myself. But in your R scripts to turn off the species and just put them into bins of demersals and I mean, that's literally how some of this can be started. So I, I want to, I'm not dismissing your frustration. It's real and there's structural things we need to talk about there. Maybe not now, but I'm trying to give you hope that there are things that you can do fairly quickly and you don't need, you know, a huge team and, and all kinds of things. The, the hurdle to get started on this is probably lower than you might be thinking. Hopefully that was helpful or hopeful. Hopefully that was hopeful. That's too many hopes. Let's end on a hopeful note. All right. Thank you very much, Jason. I think we have uh, to uh, stop here.